Matthew chapter 4. We hope to finish the chapter today, and, and uh, before we do, let's just pray, and we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, your word, and we, we thank you for uh, your guidance and direction in these things, Lord, that it's not just something we read, and not a book with good information, but let it's living and powerful. And as your Holy Spirit leads, Lord, that we would live by it, that we'd go out into this world and, and, and be your disciples, Lord, to, to hear the call and respond. And so we just pray right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon this place, prepare our hearts, Lord, help us to receive your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus, your precious name, amen. Uh, one, one other thing I did forget tonight, uh, we were supposed to do the caroling, and, uh, you know, initial at the beginning of the week, Luke and the boys asked me, Justin even said, hey, what are we going to do if it rains? I'm like, oh, you guys, man up, you sissies, you know, a little rain, not going to hurt us. Last year, Orland and, and us and the high school kids had gone out in his neighborhood, and it was raining, and, and it was miserable. But I did not expect all of that wind, and so, yes, we will not be doing that tonight, not going to put you guys into that. Um, we are going to have a small group that are going to get together, and we'll probably go over to Brentwood. We called over to Brentwood and going to go over to the elderly home and, and worship and, and bless them. And so if you're one of those who just want to come out and carol, please join us. We'll have some coffee here and stuff at 6, and it'll be real quick, and it'll be done for the night. But uh, yeah, don't want, to, don't want to brave this weather. Kurt, uh, Pastor Kurt in first service said, Greg, what's wrong? Are you a sissy? I'm all, yes. I succumb. I was wrong, Justin. I was wrong, Luke. Let it be what it be, right? Anyway, let's get started into our word today. Last, last week, we got into chapter 4, and we got to see the temptation of Jesus. And we learned an, a, a few things from, from Jesus, is that this is indeed a spiritual battle that we're involved in. That in this life, we're, we're guaranteed that. And In fact, Paul told the Corinthians there in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So our weapons, our weapons are not of this world. They're, they're the things that God would intend us to use. It's the same weapon that Jesus used. It's the word of God, the sword of his truth. And so we, we grasp the word and we use it in this battle. And we also learned of the importance of being led by the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit that leads us day by day, moment by moment. We saw Jesus model that to us. He, his life was Spirit-led. And that's the life that we now lead. And, and how often I miss the leading of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit will whisper to me and say, hey, here's the opportunity. And, and I miss that opportunity because I'm either not listening or I hear it. And I just, uh, because of fear or whatever reason, I neglect to do it. But Jesus modeled that for us. And, and so to this point, all that Jesus has done is really, uh, he's done to identify for us so that we could uh, identify with him and relate to him. You know, we see in his birth, his upbringing, his death, his resurrection, his ministry, all those things, <coughs> excuse me, that we would relate to him. And so we learn so much of him and, and we want to continue today. And today we learn two more things. And I want to note these. First is that his desire for us is a relationship. And in that relationship, it's a discipleship model. He, he wants us to be his disciples and he calls us to that. And the second thing is, is his desire to save sinful man. He came that we would repent. And we see that. In verse 17, he says, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's now. And he says in verse 23 that he, he has come to teach and to preach the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And, and, and so we're going to look at those things today. And, and so be, he begins his Galilean ministry here. We read verses 12 through 16. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and he dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So Matthew says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. What we find of, of Jesus' ministry is that other Gospels, John and uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, indicate that 
His first ministry Jesus did was actually baptizing in the Jordan along with John. And we find that the two were in that same area. And it was sometimes, sometime after the, the rest of, of John the Baptist that Jesus went to Galilee uh, to begin this ministry in, ministry in this region. Um, John's, in John's Gospel in chapter 1, it records for us an early ministry of Jesus. Apparently, Jesus had spent a year prior to this time ministering to, to people in that area. Um, you know, the, the disciples, he had called some of them during that time. Um, there was a, a wedding that was in Cana that they saw the miracle of the wine, and there, there was the first cleansing of the temple. And then, and then, you know, there was that interview with Nicodemus. And so some of this ministry in Judea had already taken place, and, and now uh, John tells us what happened uh, also during that time when Jesus traveled through Samaria. And he met the Samaritan woman at the, at the well. And so there was some ministry that had transpired there. And, and yet they're, they're both doing work in the Jordan area, baptizing. And it was after this imprisonment that, that John tells us that Jesus was prompted to go. Excuse me, Matthew tells us that Jesus was prompted to go to Galilee, return to Galilee. Morgan states this, he says, Galilee was under the rule of Herod who had imprisoned John, into that region our Lord went to continue the ministry of the man thus silenced. Thus it has ever been, and still is. Evil may silence a voice, but it cannot prevent the proclamation of the word. If John is imprisoned, then Jesus takes up the message. And so in that we see there's a purpose behind um, John's imprisonment. You know, that the message would continue. And truly God's will is done here. God's will cannot be stopped. I'm reminded again of of the time with the disciples there as they're in Acts and they're, they're healing people and they're preaching the gospel and they're imprisoned for it. And Gamaliel comes to the religious leaders and in Acts 5, 38 and 39, he says this, he says, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. So God's will is done. You know, his, his purposes, his message, the message of the gospel is not going to be stopped. And, and, and we see that. And it, that is so true, especially when it's in the area of persecution. You know, we see that, uh, you know, back in the time here when we look at Saul, who becomes Paul, and he, he authorizes the stoning of Stephen. And at that point, we see in, in Acts chapter 8, you know, the, the people spread out. They, they, they ran from that area because of the persecution. They were completely scattered. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 9, we read at the very end, Acts 9.31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Amazing. We see the work of God again. His message will not be stopped. And, and, and in fact, we see it multiplied. What a blessing we see in that. And, and the second application of this, why John left, I kind of see it as a fulfillment of John's ministry. You know, not only did God's word need to be continued, and Jesus needed to begin that ministry, but John's ministry to point towards the coming king was fulfilled in Jesus. And we read in John 3, 25 through 30, it says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in, in Anan and near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, he who, is, who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So John points out that God is the one in control here. He's sovereign. You know, I'm not competing with the work of Jesus. He's the fulfillment of that work. The, God the Father has given him authority from heaven to do these things. And he's, you know, basically no man can compete with the will of God again. And, and so we see that in verse 28. John says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He was, 
the one to prepare the way for the Messiah. You know, he, he literally states here that he's a zero preaching a hero. I'm nothing. I'm not worthy to unloose his sandals, you know, as John was saying. And he, he goes on, he says in verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the one who has come for the church, his bride. And, and John, he says, I'm just the friend. You know, I get to stand by him and I get to rejoice. You know, my, my joy is fulfilled, he said. And, and literally his point is, is, look, I heard the father's voice. The father said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And, and so John realizes, I've prepared the way. And, and then he says, you know, as my ministry comes to completion, I must decrease. He must increase. And, and that's true of us as his disciples. You know, as we come and believe in his work, that we're to go and make disciples. We're, we're to prepare the way for Jesus to come into people's hearts. That we're to do that work. And that's our ministry. And God's left that for us to do. And so as we walk out this faith, faith of ours, we have to begin to surrender more and more of this life to him. We have to become, uh, as, as our own priorities drop off and him as our primary priority. It has to be that I serve him, we serve him. He doesn't serve us. It's not, we don't come here that we get something from him. We're here to serve him. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. An instrument of death, take up your cross. Surrender your life. It's not what we want to hear in life sometimes. So easy to fall back into the things that we find joy and peace in, right? But this Christian walk is a challenge because it is but a vapor. It's a, a, a very small life. And yet we, we find so much value, worldly value in it. God calls us to so much more. Not that we can't be successful in the many things that life brings us, but that our focus should be on what am I doing for the Lord in that arena of my life? Yes, I, I am successful in this or that. God has blessed me with those things. Those, those are his to give. Now let me repay him back. Let me do the work that he's called me to in that ministry. And so Jesus departed to Galilee. And, you know, this region of Galilee is, is literally a, a very small area, about the size of the state of Connecticut. Uh, the historian Josephus tells us there was about three million people there that populated that area. The majority of them were Gentiles, though there were, you know, areas and pockets of little cities of Jews and, and many citizens there. Um, we find that, that Jesus leaves Nazareth to go and dwell in Capernaum. You know, it's an area... Uh, north by the Sea of Galilee, north of uh, Jerusalem and, and Nazareth. And he goes up and along this, this lake. He, he plants himself and dwells in Capernaum. And it's interesting, he doesn't dwell in Nazareth. Of all the places, the places of his upbringing, you would think, okay, this is a place that he should be doing his ministry. And what we find is, is that Jesus was rejected by his own people. And, and even he says that in John 4, 4, 4, 4 44, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. And so he had no honor in his own hometown. You know, an indictment towards these guys for sure. Isaiah says this of him in 53.3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Man, can you imagine God in your midst? And yet you don't esteem him. You don't lift him up. They despised and rejected him. And I think that sometimes that, that happens with us. You know, we have a family member that we continue to share with. And they just don't want to hear it. You know, they're too familiar with us. You know, you're, Greg, you're just a relative. And, you know, I don't need to hear from you. You know, you're, who are you? You know, you're my cousin or you're whatever, you know. And, and they don't want to hear it. You know, they're too familiar. And that was the case, I believe, here with, with Jesus. You know, they were too familiar with him. We'll find that there are those opportunities as family members, that we need to stay the course. 
You know, Vicki uh, Greer shared with me uh, first service. There, there was a young man who had uh, a brother-in-law, and he shared with his brother-in-law constantly. And his brother-in-law would tell him, stop sharing with me. And he, and he would continue to do it. And every time he'd ask, stop sharing with me, he'd say, I love you too much to not share the truth. Until the young man came to uh, his brother-in-law, who was now diagnosed with cancer and on his deathbed, and he came to him and said, are you ready to hear the gospel? And he goes, I've been waiting for you to come back and tell me the gospel. I'm ready to receive. So we've got to stay the course because there will be those opportunities that our loved ones, our family members will hear. We'll have those times. And we'll see later on this morning, Andrew will have an opportunity to share with his brother who will receive Peter. So then it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Isaiah prophet. Matthew stays the course here with his argument that Jesus fulfills prophecy. He fulfills all scripture. If Matthew were here today, I don't believe he'd be a tax collector. I'd be, I believe he'd be a lawyer. He's got, he's got the law down. He's got the word of God, and he brings the proof. Here, look. And, and the, he uses Isaiah 9, 1 through 2, that predicted the ministry of, of the Messiah. And he, and he says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. They've seen a great light. See, the Galileans were really truly despised, especially amongst the Jews. They, they didn't have a, a religion per se, and they were pretty much immersed in the darkness of just the world, living in, in, in the life that they had and doing the things. And, and, you know, this kind of reminds me of the world we live in today. You know, there's pockets of darkness. And when, when there's an absence of God's word, there is a, a complete darkness and difficulty. And, and these guys lived in and amidst this. And And yet, amongst this, it says that a great light had shone. And there's three things that light does. Light, well, it exposes. We can see each other because there's light, right? It it comforts. You know, if you've ever been in a room completely deprived of light, where there is no light, not even a little crack of the windowsill, it it can be quite scary. You know, in absence, I remember um, when I was younger, my cousins put me in like a, a little toy chest and shut the door and sat on the lid. And I remember the panic that sat in because there was no light. And then you feel like you're just, you can't breathe, can't do anything. Absence of light is a, is a dark and scary thing. And, and, and then the last thing it does, it provides warmth. You know, and I can tell you that. The lights up here keep me warm. You guys might be a little chilly back there, but light brings warmth. And, and I think of Jesus, he's this great light. How does he expose? Well, Jesus exposes sin, right? The light of Jesus is going to expose sin in our life. But it's also going to comfort us because it's the gospel. It's the good news that my sin isn't so far buried me that I'm I'm without hope. And, And then it does provide warmth in the fact that I have hope of the promise of all eternity, that I will one day spend eternity with my Lord and Savior. So light brings those things, and, and we see that Jesus did and come as this light. Jesus declared here in John uh, chapter 8, verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So, you know, those who were lost in this area of Galilee had seen a great light, and they were beginning to walk. They we're going to see the call of the disciples to, to him, and and, but as the, the light of the world, Jesus began with this. This verse, verse 17, exposing sin. It says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He began to preach. And, and truly, when we, we look at preaching, we would say that Jesus' main occupation was preaching. He did indeed take times to come in and touch and heal and love people. But his primary occupation was that of preaching. Um, David Guzik says this of it. He says, On the whole, it seems fair to say that Jesus was a preacher and a teacher who healed more than he was a healer who also preached and taught. So his primary occupation, his ministry, was to teach people, to come in and proclaim the truth of God's word and then illustrate it for them. And, and, and in the, Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said this to his disciples, in Mark 138, 
But he said to them, I, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. His purpose was to preach, to preach the word of God, to bring a light to the dark world, that they would see the truth of God. And so he did that. And, and this is that priority again in verse 23 of this chapter 4. He, he proclaims, I'm going to preach and teach the word. And so preach, the word uh, preach in Greek is kurosian. And it's literally defined as this, which is the word of a herald's proclamation from a king. Here is Jesus, our king, with a proclamation. Right? He's making this proclamation. I love that. And he's saying, repent. Now, you know, the gospel uh, Jesus preached, it began the same way that John did. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is, is now, is at hand. And so we see that, and Jesus carries on this message. But repentance, we need to take a look at this word because it's, it's really important. Repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, or having remorse or regret for something you've done, some sin you've committed. It, it goes so much further than that. And um, this commentary defines it as this. He said, called uh, for throughout the Bible, this repentance is a summons to a personal, absolute, and ultimate, unconditional sur- to surrender to God as sovereign. God is the right one when it comes to judging my sin and repentance. He, he looks at it, and he, uh, it's an absolute unconditional surrender to him as those things. And, and if I were to put it in layman's turn, it's an, a going of the other direction, 180 degree moving away from where I was at. If I'm walking in sin this way, my repentance is, Lord, I acknowledge that is wrong, and I go the other direction. That's repentance. That's true repentance. And when I do that, I begin to move towards God, and I receive his forgiveness. Now, as, as believers, we know that we're all sinners, that each and every one of us has come before the Lord as a believer and asked for those, that forgiveness from the Lord, and he's forgiveness. All sins, past, present, future. So what do I do with that process of walking in sin? Well, the scripture is pretty clear. For those who continue to walk in those things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if I continue to walk in those sins, then I won't inherit the kingdom of God. But if I repent and begin to turn away from them, it doesn't mean I won't fall into that sin, but repentance means I'm turning away from that. I'm beginning to move away from that, acknowledge it for what it is. And it's a daily thing. I daily I come before the Lord and say, Lord, Man, I fell into that one again. You know, I'm, no, I'm not the man I was 20-some years ago. Praise God, right? And that's the way it should be. We should see us grow in our walk. There should be a movement of us getting more and more like Jesus in our walk. And so that repentance, it's a, a turning away. And, and Mark's gospel says this. He says, Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the remedy to sin. The remedy to sin is to repent and believe. Not believe in my ability, but to believe in Jesus' ability to, to, to cover my sins. Paul says this to the Romans 10.9, that if we confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess with our mouth, believe in my heart. What Jesus did was take my sins as far as the east is from the west. I will be saved. You know, that's so important for us. So that's repentance. And that's what that looks like. Jesus says we're to do this because what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and quite literally, this, this message that Jesus is declaring here, this at, at hand is, is, is really defined in the Greek as time. And, and there's two words for time. Chronos, which is like the clock, our watches. And then there's karos, which is a time span or a frame of time. And Jesus said, this is the frame of time for your salvation. The kingdom of heaven is right now this time frame for us, all of us, from this time till he returns. It is this opportunity. Pastor Jacob Bielan, he says this, that's the message Jesus came to preach. And in every city he visited, that was the gospel he declared. Good news, the kingdom of God is here. You've got a period of time now in which you can respond by repenting of your ways and believing in me. 
And that makes it really simple, doesn't it? Now is the time. Repent. Believe. If you're here and you have never asked Jesus into your life, pay close attention. The Lord is speaking to you here today. He's, he's desiring for you to draw in, into him and, and hear him speak to you. Today is your day. Right? Before we move into two, 2020, today is the day. So Jesus begins to, to multiply his ministries. He begins to move on. and He models his discipleship for us as, before he calls these guys. And, and I'm reminded that discipleship, you know, it's, it's for us to do in our realm of influence. Whether it's my workplace, my home, uh, out in the streets where I might know people. You know, it, it's wherever God has me. You know, Acts 1.8 tells us that we're, we'll receive uh, power from on high and we're to be his witnesses. And it says in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. Jerusalem is our red bluff, right? Judea, it's our, our county, our state. We move on outside that and we go to the uttermost. We need to be those that are discipling in our area of influence. Right now, it's red bluff. Right now, it might be your home. You know, it might, now, it might be a discipleship class. But it also could be to the state. You might be traveling. Maybe you take a purposeful trip down into San Francisco and you go and minister to people. Maybe it's, hey, I feel called to missions and I'm going to go on a trip and I want to I wanna reach the uttermost. You know, there, the, not all of us are called into the mission life. A missionary's life, they're called to a people group. And they're there to minister that. So short-term ministry doesn't, missions work, doesn't really take advantage of what a missions, missionary's life is like. You know, we, we're there to support that, right? But we can begin to plant seeds to help disciple. We're supporting a group of people in an uttermost to do that work, to disciple people. That's the work we want to see take place. So sometimes we get involved in missions and we think we're doing a really good job because we're bringing humanity aid. And, and that, those are always good things, but they're not what God calls us to. We're to provide those things, but our purpose, our goal is to, to disciple people, to support the discipleship work. So as a pastor and my staff, I will tell you, when we plan and look on areas to go, we're thinking about how we can support the process of discipleship where we're going. We'll come alongside those missionaries and say, what can we do to support you in making disciples? Okay, Because it's like, it's like the same concept of teaching somebody to fish or just giving them the fish. Right? We, want, we want them to be able to do that themselves. And so Jesus, again, is modeling this. And, and in our, our country, you know, a lot of people uh, conclude that they're Christians because, after all, we live in a Christian nation, right? So I must be a Christian. And, you know, the, the requirements here is, is that God calls us to be disciples, not believers. Disciples, the, the call is so much deeper. And we're going to see that, the cost that comes with that, with these four guys that Jesus is going to call into ministry. Verses 18 through 22, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So he saw these two brothers casting their nets into the sea. And, and so this was not the first time that Jesus had an encounter with these men. We find from previous Gospels in John chapter 1 and in Luke 5, that Jesus had spent a year in a previous ministry. He had been ministering with uh, John the Baptist, baptizing, but prior to that, he had spent some time in this Judean Dan ministry again. And, and, it, and it's quite likely that these guys had a year to consider who Jesus was. And so their, their initial calling was a time of consideration. They're like, what is Jesus doing? And, and they, they no doubt witnessed a bunch of things that Jesus did. His speech, the way he talked, the truth that he spoke, the way that he loved. And so they had this year to, to really, you know, think about it. But the fishing industry here was prosperous. You know, it, it, we find later on that, that both Peter and, and John had homes. So they had money. They had the ability. They had the wealth 
that goes along with that. And so for them to leave was a tremendous sacrifice. They were given up more than just, you know, a job. There was tremendous finances. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And he said, I'll make you fishers of men. Change your occupation altogether. And, and in the Gospel of John, we're told that Andrew was the one that went and told Simon, Peter, his brother. And I love that. Yeah, it says in John 1, 41, 42, he first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So Peter became the first person in the New Testament to be reached by a family member. What a unique situation that was, right? And, and Andrew became the first disciple to actually share the gospel. And, and I love that. You don't read a lot about Andrew in the gospels, but we know Peter. Peter was an amazing man, and, and, and praise God that uh, we see this in their lives. And again, it, it's a reminder to me to stay the course, because someday that family member is going to listen, going to listen to you. And, and the one thing I want to note in this too is, is that this is the single greatest way God works in reaching people. It's that one-on-one -on -one discipleship, you know? That friend you have, they look at your life, and you come and you tell them, and they're like, yeah, I see it. I see what's going on in your life. I want that. You know, I want Jesus in my life. It's, it's, it's relational, and um, again, it's, it's who's in your sphere of influence. You're impacting somebody. You may not know it, but you're impacting somebody. You know, I, I am blessed by the fact that we have almost 60 students in our school back there. And it's a tremendous burden. I will tell you that. It is not easy to have 60 students. I can't imagine Mr. Brosi over here with all his kids at the high school. I can, I, can, I can tell you, though, it's those moments, those little glimpses of those little moments when those kids come and they touch your heart. And you know that God is doing something in their life. You know, God has, has got a plan for this young man. And I had a part in that. You know, I got to share something with them, and it, it changed the route of their life. And, and, and that's, that's the blessing of, of discipleship. You know, your sphere of influence. You guys are making an impact. Just you have to be led by the Spirit to hear those things and then respond to them, be obedient to the call. So Jesus says, follow me. And literally for, for these disciples, this was to follow Jesus around and absorb his teaching. You know, it was just, where's Jesus going now? and listening, every opportunity to grow. And, and Jesus said this in Luke. He said, uh, in Luke 9.23, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So he, he reminds them of this. You know, it is a, a die-to kind of a thing. That, that pick up your cross, is, it's an instrument of death. That means I have to let go of the things I want so that I can do the things that God wants. You know, and, and so being his disciple means it's going to cost me something. You know, it, it's a total surrender of the way of life. And he says, follow me. So what is meant by follow me? Other than absorbing his teaching, what does that look like in our life? And, and what we find is that it's a, it's a radical change of lifestyle. A radical change of life where we begin to seek the kingdom of God. You know, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all these things that we tried to chase before will be added unto us. You know, we're talking about the things that we, we have need of, clothing, you know, home, those types of things. Seek God first. And then all those things that you, you think are the priority, I'll add them to you. You know, so God is our priority. And, and we see that. And, and so these, these four guys, we're going to see the example they leave for us. It said that they immediately left their nets. They left their nets and immediately left the boat. They left their father. And they followed Jesus. They left it all. Everything they'd ever known. You know, we, we, in our society and culture, you know, we have job after job after job. We, we don't, not too many of us can say I've had a career of a job, you know. So for these guys, it's all that they knew. They were raised from the time they were kids. And for them to just say, eh, I'm following this, was, was tremendous. And it, it was a complete and utter surrender. And so they left these things, and it was an immediate response. After they considered for this year, when Jesus made the call, they were, they didn't hesitate. They just did it. 
And so to me, that speaks a lot about the call here, the follow me. It, it, again, it's, it's a matter of responding to God's call. Has he called you to something specific that you have failed to be obedient in? Have, has he said to you, I want you to speak to this person, and you failed to do that? You know, I, I'm, I'm reminded so often I fall short in this area. I hear the Holy Spirit speak. This is your opportunity. And, and whether it's an, a, a realm of like someone's offended you. You know, Matthew 18, the principle, the biblical principle is that God's word says, when someone offends you, you're to go to them and uh, confront them in love, right? And I'm reminded of the hard ability, the ability to do that. It's tough. And, and yet God is so faithful to remind me, here's your opportunity. And so often I will say, you know, Lord, I'm going to love them. I'm just going to give them grace. Well, wait a minute. Is that what God calls us to? To give them grace? No, he said, if someone's offended you, you're to go to them. And how often I fail in that, you know? We are not loving them by withholding a judgment or a, 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 in a loving way confronting somebody. We aren't doing them any justice. It's as if we watch somebody drive their car, they, they roll over my toes, so don't stop here, just keep rolling over somebody else's toes, and at the end of that, there's a cliff, and they're going to drive over the cliff. Right? And all this damage is upon people and upon themselves. And because I want to issue grace and I want to issue love, no, it's not what God calls us to. He calls us to a greater degree of relationship. That relationship is the responsibility for me to say to somebody, what you said hurt. And, and I want you to understand I love you and I'm saying it in love. And I want you to, to receive it that way. I love you enough to tell you honestly. And that I want to see you grow. And that's hard. That's hard for all of us. But it's, it's, it's what God calls us to here. It's, it's a discipleship again. And, and as I look at these guys, I, I'm reminded as well that they were able to surrender all these things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. But as he gives them the invitation, you know, two sets of brothers, a dad who had a successful business, again, homes, they were willing to give these things up I don't know what happened to the, the lucrative business. You know, I don't know what happened to the dad. But what I do know is that these guys were radically changed. That because they were obedient, their lives were different. Probably not what they expected to live their life like. But they were obedient to God's word, his calling. And because of that, they're changed. They left their nets, they left the boat, they left their dad. And, and what do we know of these guys? We know that every one of these disciples was martyred for the gospel. That, it, to us, is a bad outcome. Martyred, bad, die, bad. They stand before the Lord. They serve with our God. They sit on his, next to his throne. You know, that's the promise God has for us, the eternal life. This life is but a vapor, and he has so much more in store for us. They were changed for the better not for the worse because they faced martyrdom. No, their life was changed and they weren't the person they used to be, nor were they the person they were at that point. They kept growing and they, were, they, were, they never regretted it, guaranteed. They never looked back and said, no, I'm, I'm repenting of this belief. No, they stuck to their guns because they knew it was the right thing and they were blessed. So these first disciples, they did what the disciples of Jesus should do. They answered the call. They followed him and and so that means to me that we leave things behind. It, it means like, like the, the Samaritan woman, she left her picture. Matthew, he left his tax table. You know, blind Bartimaeus, he left his cloak. You know, he, they were changed and they just said, leave the things. I don't need them. I have Jesus. And, and, and Jesus, again, we, we see this in, in Matthew 6.24. It says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We, we can't balance it, guys. We don't get our cake and eat it too. God wants all of us. Uh, I, I read this, I think it was a commentary. And it, what it was, it was a woman who had a dream. And in her dream, they were going through the rapture. And people were being lifted into the heavens. And, and she's starting to raise from earth. And she's realizing that she's not going as high as everybody else. And she looks around and I'm, I'm only 20 feet off the ground and what's going on? And so in her dream, she looks down and there's a rope tied to her ankle. 
And that rope follows it down, and it's to all her furniture and her belongings in her home. And then she woke up. And she realized, the Lord was showing me that my priorities were wrong, that I was tied to this world. I need to put him first. And we see that, you know, that we can't have two masters. We, we serve Jesus only. Put him first in our life. And so it, it means striving to be like him. And it, he always obeyed the Father, didn't he? He always obeyed the Father. And in fact, he tells us that in John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. It means that Jesus is Lord of our lives. It means he, he helps me navigate my life. I don't get to navigate my own life. He navigates it for me. And Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's a heavy portion of scripture there. Because it means to me that it's not about saying I believe or I'm a Christian. It's a relationship. I need to know him. I can do some amazing things in my own abilities. And maybe God even allows some of those things. But if I don't know him personally, I'm setting myself up for the wrong way, right? So every decision and dream is, is, is filtered through the Word of God, everything. And, and it has to be that the Word of God is leading my life. Psalms 119, 105, your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's Word is what guides and directs us, guys. It's, it's what we have to cling to. Paul tells the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, this life's about doing things to the glory of God. How am I making an impact for Jesus in my life? You know, because I have my dreams. I want to be this. You know, you lay it out. What is your dream? You know, I, I tell my son, who wants to be a professional baseball player, I tell him all the time, Son, I wish I could have been a player too. I love baseball. But without God, baseball is empty. Without God, all the things that that will bring are empty. If you don't put God first, I doubt that God will allow you to be blessed by that because he will compete with nothing. He wants you and you own. We have to put God first in our life. And, and, and the point is here, though, too, is that we're not saved by the things we do for Christ, right? Right? It's not a matter of works, you know. It's the gift of grace I receive that pushes me on and encourages me to do the things to be pleasing to the Lord. Because I have grace, I want to do these things. It's the grace of God that we have salvation. And so, and he explains in scripture here that the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside of us and empowers us for these things, the gifts. He guides us and and so to follow Christ means that I listen to the Holy Spirit, I listen to his word, and I move those things. And it's going to be a challenge daily. Daily a challenge to die to the flesh, to, to live to the Spirit. And, and so, but it's going to be to fulfill Jesus' purposes in our life. He closes with the last couple of verses, and really it's, he models this ministry for us. I love that because as Jesus would teach and preach, he would bring a truth he would tell me the truth and then illustrate it, but then he would model it. He'd show us it. And so we see him kind of begin to do that. It says, and Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And then his fame went throughout all Syria, and, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So teaching. So he was teaching and preaching. And really the difference is that teaching is making application. Preaching is proclaiming the truth. So today I'm preaching and teaching. Proclaiming God's truth, teaching you the illustration. Jesus would do that. He was the master at that. He'd bring alongside a truth, alongside a parable. He'd illustrate it in the things they'd understand. I love the fact that he used fisher, fishermen to make them fishers of men, right? 
Fishermen would know what it means to catch a, a catch. They would know the effort put in place, you know, casting their nets. Now they would cast the gospel net, right? Some of these guys are doing what? Cleaning the nets, mending the nets, repairing them. To me, that's a picture of ministry. Some of us are called to go out and cast the nets. Some of us are called to mend the nets, fix them up so that people can do the work of ministry. It's, it's neat how Jesus would do that. He was, he was the pro of that. And he says that it's the gospel of the kingdom. He's preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news of the kingdom. Well, he, he preached his coming. That's Jesus' coming. I'm preaching the good news of the kingdom. That Jesus came to die on the cross. Now, these guys thought he was coming to do what? To conquer. To be the conquering king. You know, to overthrow the Romans. But he came, his first coming was to come and to die for our sins. He was that sheep, the lamb that was slain for us. And so that gospel, the good news, our God, who made us, who loves us, came to earth to relate to us, to, to, to understand us, that we could relate to him. And not only did he come as a baby, humble, he lived out this life so that he could come to the end of that life, bear our sins. He lived perfectly. He was that unblemished lamb without spot. Perfect, beautiful. He was sacrificed. There's nothing he ever did that was wrong. And he died for our sins. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And, and you know, the good news is that Jesus had come to save his people from their sins. And, and that has to be, for us, amazing news. We rejoice now as we sing these songs. You know, I think of the shepherds who saw the angels in the field. And, and, and last night, I'm around, I were watching um, this TV show. It's called Chosen. If you haven't watched it, there's an app for it. Um, but it's about the life of Jesus. And in this one, it is the Christmas story. And these shepherds, it goes through a day in their life. How they, you know, they're living out in the field. And the shepherds are really there to bring an unspotted, unblemished sheep to the to the. Um, to be sacrificed. And as they show these guys come down, one guy comes down and he brings his sheep, he presents it to the Pharisee and the religious leader, and he looks and looks, and of course he finds something underneath the arm. And, you bring this garbage here, and get out of here. Don't come back until you have an unspotted, perfect sacrifice. And as the story goes throughout that night, the angels appear to them, and they run to, to Bethlehem, and they see Jesus in the manger. And the next scene shows them running to tell everybody, right? And as they go back, the young man is confronted by that same religious leader. And he says, I told you never to come back here unless you had an unspotted um, lamb. Have you indeed an unspotted lamb? And he says, I've seen an unspotted lamb. He saw the Lord. Isn't that amazing? He had seen Jesus, that unspotted perfect sacrifice. And what a beautiful thing that is for us this time of year. Christmas. You know, we get to see our Lord. We don't come to worship because of his birth, right? It was his life. Birth was a part of that. Christmas is a part of that for us, but it was the gift that God gave us that he lived out that life. Crucifixion, the cross. And so Jesus is our Savior, and it says that great multitudes followed him. You know, Jesus' purpose was not to bring attention to himself, these great miracles, it was to draw people so they would hear the gospel message, that they would get saved. It was salvation. And so as we close today, you know, we learn three things here. God's gospel message is not going to be stopped, guys. Whether you are obedient or not, guess what? God will find somebody to make that message heard. Whether it's in China, whether it may be our, your next door neighbor, God will continue that. You know, here we are some 2,000 years past Jesus' birth. And, you know, the disciples were martyred, but yet the message still continues. You know, we're here, we're gathered because of Jesus. The second thing is that Jesus' desire is to save sinful man. <clears throat> he said, repent, <clears throat> for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preached the gospel of the, of the kingdom. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry guys. <clears throat> the time is now, he said. It's at hand. Today is the time. Again, I said I'd give you that opportunity. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. 
You never said, man, I'm a sinner, but I believe in your work, Jesus. You've come and maybe you've considered. Maybe you've hit and missed. Maybe you come at Christmas time and Easter. Maybe you're here every week and you're just considering. You just have not given your life to the Lord. Don't waste another day. Because Jesus said today, now is the time to consider and follow, surrender your life to him. You know, Romans Road is, is <clears throat> the scripture in Romans that we use. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You know, our sin brings about death, physical and spiritual. Separates us from God, you know. And then it says, but God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But, right there, there's, a, there's that proclamation. God so loved us that if we believe in that, that he will save us. And then Romans 10, 9, we talked about that earlier. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all sins. Confession is made with our mouth. So I'm going to give that opportunity in a moment. But if you're here and you are a believer, I'm going to challenge you. Have you answered the call? Are you a disciple or are you a believer? There's a difference. Disciples will go out and do the things that God calls them to do. There will be a surrender in your life to the things that he's called you to do. There'll be a cost to your time, your resources. there will be a cost to your pride as you have to step out in faith and share the gospel with somebody. Those are things that we need to be challenged in and grow in. You know, disciples are willing because God was so faithful. And that's where we need to be. So if you're that, that believer, there's a process that starts with in our walk. Start considering what has God's word said to you. Consider like the disciples did. Consider his works and his callings to you. And then, and then there is a surrender that follows that. Surrender to him. Say, Lord, I surrender to that, whatever that call. For me, that's put me right where I'm at today. I didn't want to be here. You guys know that. But I had to come to the point where I knew enough about Jesus that when he said, I'm calling you to this, I had to say, okay, Lord, I surrender. Not my will, Lord, but yours. And each of us has to be confronted with that. Consider, surrender, and then guess what? Spend time with him. Grow. Grow. Spend time with him. It's a relationship, right? And as you spend time with him, the Holy Spirit begins to empower you for things. And he guides and directs you day by day. And then guess what? The process repeats because it's called sanctification. God is not done with each of us. You know, I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the man that I need to be. I'm in the process. Each of us is that way. God is working in our lives. So the time's come. The time is now. And as we close in prayer, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand so that I can pray with you. Because God has you here today. If you're here and you don't know him, he said, now is the time. You know, be assured of your faith that if you were to die tomorrow, you'd stand with him. You'd be with him. And that's what he wants, that relationship with you. So let's pray, close our eyes, bow our heads. And Lord, as we pray, I just ask if there's anybody in this crowd that Lord has yet to commit their life to you, just raise your hand, lift your hand, and, and I'll pray with you that God would come into your life. He would remove your sins as far as the east is from the west, and he'd give you that new promise, a new life. Is there anybody here this morning? Lord, you are so faithful, and we thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, as we celebrate Christmas, this Christmas season, Lord, help us remember that, it, that you are the true reason for this season, Lord, that we come to worship a living King who died for us, who rose from the grave, conquered death and sin, that we might have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that it's your work in our life. Your Holy Spirit would be, be in us and move us and direct us, give us strength and as we praise you and worship you, Lord. We, we thank you for the many calls that you have put upon our life, even the ones that we've neglected. Thank you, Lord, that you're patient and you give us second opportunities. Lord, I pray that you would put a call upon each and every person in here. Lord, that they would know exactly where you want them, what you want them to do. That, Lord, they, they themselves would surrender to the things of this world and find themselves being a disciple, one who is reaching others 
teaching others, preaching the word even, and Lord, just leading people to you because it is all about you. Thank you, Jesus, for the gospel of this kingdom, that it's such great news, that, Lord, that you've given us this gift. Your love wins out in the end, Lord. We thank you for that. In Jesus, your precious name, amen. Well, if you guys have any prayer needs, we have the pastors and prayer corners up here. Please come on up. And, and uh, I just wish you guys an amazing Christmas. As this next year approaches 2020, that this would be the next best year in your life where God has done some amazing things. So God bless you guys. Have a great time with family. Be safe out there. And Lord bless you. Amen.